Hi, I'm Bill Furlong, and along with my colleague, Dr. Mary Crossan, we co-host our podcast, Question of Character. We're delighted you can join us today. And remember, if this is your first time uh, listening to our podcast, you may want to go back to the first two episodes. It's kind of like a, a leader character 101, if you will, and we cover the introduction to the Ivy Leader Character Framework, some definitions and some foundational concepts. So I'd like to introduce you again to my co-host, Dr. Mary Crossan. I'm once again joined by Mary. Uh, she's a distinguished university professor at Western University, teaching at the Ivy Business School in London, Ontario. Her research has been widely published in the world's most prestigious academic journals, and she's the co-author of the book, Developing Leadership Character. Mary, welcome back. It's so good to see you. Great to be here, Bill. I would now like to introduce today's uh, special guest. He was appointed the president of the Canada Border Services Agency on December the 7th of 2016, so he's coming up on his fifth anniversary. Prior to this appointment, he was the Deputy Commissioner of Canada Revenue Agency. And he's also held senior positions as Associate Deputy Minister uh, of Public Safety Canada, and also as Assistant Secretary of International Affairs, Security and Justice Sector at the Treasury Board Secretariat. He's also held a no number of other very senior positions across the Canadian public service. Uh, he has a bachelor's, degrees, bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Victoria. And he's also a former Canadian Olympian he competed in the 1988 uh, winter or summer games uh, in the Coxless Fours uh, rowing event. Um, so we'd like, we're really pleased today to welcome John Osowski. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm humbled to be here. Well, we're delighted to have you. Um, so John, you've, you and Mary and uh, have worked, spent an awful lot of time working on uh, leadership character inside the CBSA in particular, but I think you've also worked on it in other organizations that you've been involved with too. And I think we're really interested to get your perspective, not only across those different organizations, but in particular, your role as president of a large, complex, multinational Canadian Crown Corporation that has really embraced leadership character. So we'd really like to get your thoughts on, on a number of different questions that we've, uh, that we wanted to discuss with you today. So if it's okay with you, let's just jump right into it. Sure. So John, let's start with the first question. Uh, you've been a strong advocate and supporter of leader character in uh, Canada Border Services Agency, as well as several other public sector agencies. What is it about leader character or character-based leadership that's caught your imagination? So it's a great question. I was reflecting on this um, before this session and I was trying to remember exactly how it first happened. And I think I came down to Ivy to uh, give a little talk session as part of a um, uh, leadership development program. We had a couple of, of uh, colleagues attending the session. It was the one with Richard Discerny and uh, Paul Booth. I don't know the exact name of the program, but um, both of the individuals commented about this and it has at around the same time we were going through a bit of a challenge with some of our culture um, at the public uh, safety department that I was at at the time <clears throat> and um, we really decided that we needed to unpeel the onion and um, I've always been interested in the leadership development aspect of myself uh, and this started, you know, I don't know, maybe Mary's got a different recollection, but for me, it was just um, kind of just fell into it. But I mean, I, I immediately was attracted to it. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why, not just because of how accessible the language is around it, <clears throat> not just even about how practical it is, but something that sounds a little West Coast-ish was the, the whole thing around the balance, like the excess deficiency Type of thing. And I'll tell you a, a funny little anecdote. My sister's actually a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine. And if you're aware of any of that, it's, you know, it's based on the energy flow, your chi through these 12 meridians through your body. Now, we only have 11 uh, character leading elements, but so maybe we have to work on a 12th one to make it like the Chinese side. But, um, you know, there's, uh, it, it, it all is about um, the flow and whether it's in excess or deficiency. And I know Mary talks about the virtuous versus the vice uh, side of it um, in, in, in her work as she's explaining it. But um, that's sort of, it, there was just something there about it that, that instantly attracted to me because it was, you know, it's accessible. And whenever we do a session, and I've been to many of Mary's sessions where she just does the intro using the Invictus film, 
everybody's excited right away because it's not like um, you know some of these other sort of assessment tools where you know you come up with a label or a color or a few letters kind of thing. It's about real language that people can can understand and instantly relate to, and then and then the work really begins, right? And I think from what I've seen certainly with myself and, and but with others is not just a professional side of things but the personal side of things as well in terms of it plants this little person on your shoulder <laughs> and it's kind of paying attention all the time um and and I, I would say that's probably the biggest thing that i've noticed for myself is um just being aware of the impact that i can have and it's changed over time right and obviously i'm in a more senior position running this this bmoth known as the canada border services agency but it's um I, I think it's uh, I think it's great, and I'm proud to have sort of been involved with Mary over the years and and taken this to various organizations, and it's always been super well received. So, no, Bill, it's interesting. I go back, and John, I actually had forgotten that you because you were at the Senior Public Sector Leadership Program with uh, Richard Discerny and Paul Booth, and yeah. They had invited you and I was sitting in the back and we, of course, we hadn't met. I'm not even sure we met that particular day, but I was teaching on that program and uh, Paul McKinnon was on that that's program. Right. And Kathy Thompson. And Kathy Thompson, that's right. And so it was then that they invited me to come back to uh, public safety around the culture and organization change. And I, I think, Bill, what I'd like to kind of pick up on this is just this interesting story of it doesn't take much, right, for somebody to resonate, start to take some action. Um, you don't have to know a lot about it. It's just that sense that there's something about it that makes sense. You put one foot in front of the other. And here we are all these years later with tremendous um, application, John, uh, about what, what you've done throughout uh, all of this with the organizations you've been with. Yeah, I know it's been quite a journey and, and we're really deep diving it right now here at CBSA. Um, you know, I've, I've moved around a fair bit. I was only at public safety for, uh, I don't know, a couple of years and same with at CRA, but here five years. Um, uh, and like we use it for everything, right? And I find one thing that I use it for in particular is when we're doing interview processes for assistant deputy ministers and really unpacking with them who they are as a leader and who they, what they know about themselves as a leader. Um, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a great process, I find, just even from a straight interview perspective compared to what we would normally look at in the public service. Well, then that's a great segue into the, the next question. You've already answered it. Is that how has how has CBSA, while you've been there and leading the organization, um, applied leader character? You've also already talked about the, the process around, I guess, hiring um, and and selection. Are there other places you've used leadership character? Other other parts of the organization where you've found it uh, applicable? Uh, absolutely. Um, so it's it's really. Um, well, I guess it, it's sort of twofold. <laughs> For some reason, wherever I've been, I've kind of fallen into this place of really wanting to understand the culture of the organization. And maybe I just paid too much attention to Drucker and, you know, culture eats strategy, but, <laughs> but, um, but I really do think it's important. And we started on a major transformation process when I arrived um, here because the organization had, you know, found itself in a tough spot financially. We were um, at the end of a pretty tight restraint period. Volumes were growing. We needed to sort of really move forward. Um, I would say we were somewhat adrift. There was a good vision of what needed to happen, but there was not really a strategy in place. And the first questions I asked were, you know, okay, so do we actually have the culture? Do we actually have the commitment to actually go down this road together and what's it going to take and why hasn't it happened yet and inevitably um and it's you know it's an interesting organization so we're about fifteen thousand people with about five thousand frontline uniformed officers um and uh there is a bit of a divide in terms of those that work the front line uh uniform tooled uh capable of using force and then the rest of us that support all of them, whether you're an IT professional or an executive or in human resources, accounting, whatever it is. Um, and so you had to you had to look at everything. And 
And one of the key areas that I really knew that we needed to focus on was that first level of frontline leadership, the superintendent, as we call them, and understanding where they were at on their leadership journey. And, and to be honest with you, over the years, what had the investment in the leadership side for that very frontline level had waned uh, considerably, and that investment had waned considerably. So we needed to spark that up. And of course, being familiar with um, Mary's work, um, started with the executive team. Uh, and now we've expanded it out in terms of how we do recruitment and selection, performance management, awards and recognition, training, um, you know, leadership development at all levels. Um, like it's, it's really embedded in really everything we do at I bet you a day doesn't go by that we actually don't talk about it in some way or another. And, you know, it, it goes in fits and starts, right? I mean, it, um, in, in some sense, in, in terms of uh, people are in different places on their leadership journey. Um, and I've done all kinds of stuff over the years, but this is the one, as I say, that has sort of universally accessible. Part of it, I think, is just Mary's, you know, uh, like that, those, those sessions that you do with the Invictus uh, and, you, and you tell that story and it's just, it's just so compelling, right? <clears throat> um, and then understanding, I think, as I say, it kind of plants a personal responsibility on individuals to think about who they are as a leader. And I think that's the biggest thing is it's done for me is it's me understanding the impact that I have um, and being a little bit more thoughtful about that, right? And it, you know, we're all in different leadership places. I mean, I've got a minister to support, brand new one right now. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's evolved over time. But I think that the, the basic um, reference point of these attributes um, stand clear. Uh, and as, as I say, I, I think that, you know, I can look at times when I've had excess or deficiency in all of them. <laughs> and I think that was, you know, that was the part where people understand that the most is, is that you can have too much courage. You can maybe have too much integrity. Um, and um, you've got to, you've got to reflect a little bit about that and how you play this out. And I think, especially for first level executives, these new leaders that under need to understand, and, and I'm doing a ceremony today for our new executives that are being inducted uh, through uh, the association of, of professional executives and in, in the government of Canada and you know, we're going to have a little chat afterwards. And the one thing I'm going to say to them is remember that you've likely gotten to where you are because you were the star analyst, you were the star person yourself. And now you're achieving results through others. So you're really responsible now for the messages that you send, the tone that you set, um, and what you bring to bear in every single conversation, because people are looking at you differently because you're now the leader, right? And so that's different for an executive, but it's also same true for that frontline superintendent that might have 10 officers reporting to them. And they're trying to understand some of the basics of like why things are happening, right? Um, and pushing down that responsibility and understanding the culture of the organization and taking responsibility for your culture through leadership um, is really what I've been trying to work, work on here at CBSA. John, there's um, that tone from the top. Uh, I think my observation watching many organizations is that people have really got that wrong as senior leaders. You know, they think it's about sometimes the command and control or instilling drive, if it, it is actually about the virtues and vice problem because that exercising the humanity, the humility at the very top of the organization, the temperance, the transcendence, you know, ones that are really weak for a lot of leaders, they're not, they're not the things that got them, as you said, to that success where they've exercised that competence. And my observation is that we are cascading down organizations, uh, a DNA tone from the top that often has that virtues vice, you know, problem associated with it. So it's really great to hear from you just even about your own leadership and reflecting back on what is it that you are um, illuminating, I guess, in the organization by the nature of your leadership itself. Yeah, and I would say this kind of 
you know, when, when I look back at myself, and certainly I would say that, um, you know, I've, I've been in the national security zone for a long time now, and I'm six foot five, and I've got a deep voice, and people kind of see me as somewhat intimidating. But, um, <clears throat> you know, when you actually spend time with me, um, I'm not the way I necessarily appear, right? <laughs> I actually have a fair degree of humility and, <laughs> um, you know, I've, uh, and I, but I am driven for sure. I have, I have no problem at all with uh, judgment and assessing situations quickly, but I'm also really comfortable being stuck um, and in a gray spot where there's no clear path forward. And I really do just trust that eventually a path forward will, will come out. And I do that through collaboration, right? I just keep poking at it. One of the scenes that I tell my guys when we've um, found ourselves in a pickle is like my, my, my favorite scene from a movie is Apollo 13. And if you recall, they, they have like a garbage bag full of duct tape and hoses and pipes and they throw it on the table and they got to bring these guys back. And they say, okay, that's it. That's all we got. What are we going to do? And I just go into that team problem solving mode, right? And it's like, there's no hero there. There's no leader. Um, and um, we're all just trying to commit to solving the problem. And, and I, you know, to go back to the rowing thing, maybe a little bit, I would say that's the one thing that's kind of unique about rowing is that you got, uh, in my case, four guys, but you could have an eight man shell, eight person shell. And um, there's no captain. Uh, everyone's got to do <clears throat> everything together perfectly. And if one person tries to squeeze it out a little bit more, <clears throat> you can throw the whole rhythm off uh, and then you slow the boat down. Um, and so here you've got eight people with big type A personalities, you know, made a lot of sacrifices and they're at the Olympics. And it's only by working in harmony <clears throat> that they actually get the job done. So in some sense, it's a leaderless group exercise, <laughs> but <clears throat> it's about sort of um, knowing who you are and, and, and how you want to sort of contribute. And so that, that part around the team and the collaboration and achieving results together through others is super important to me. There's an inspirational part of all of that as well. Like I, you know, I, I firmly believe that people can do more than they think they can. I know that I did it. Um, you know, I didn't win the win the gold medal at the Olympics. I mean, part of that is just luck and chance and the opportunity didn't sort of materialize. But um, I know that people self limit themselves, right? Um, and when you look at yourself and you spend some time to understand who you really are as a leader, what are the things that shaped you as a leader? Um, this is a great tool to sort of go through that reflective kind of process and it, and it ebbs and flows. Like you might go through a period where you're, you know, you've got a little bit too much humility or not enough courage or, uh, you know, in, in our organization, when you look at it collectively, we're, we're a little weak in, in, in temperance. Um, so, uh, I don't know. I, I just think it's around the language and the accessibility and just really understanding who you are. And, and this tool is amazing for helping people understand that. And people want to be good leaders and people deserve to be led by good leaders and, you know, giving people the right tools that they can continue to work with. I just think is so important. And, uh, I think it's really starting to show great results here at CBSA. So that brings us to a, to a question then, John, a little bit about, and you've already touched on this in terms of your, your own leadership and, and how I think with your exposure to the leader character framework, it's changed, I think, your awareness and how you understand leadership. And, and how, how have you seen your own leadership change and grow? And maybe even relative to your own well-being as well, and, you know, in that context, is there, have you noticed changes by, by practicing the, and using the leader character framework? Yeah, I mean, you know, I would say that um, for me, probably temperance as with the organization is a little bit on the low side, um, systemically. <laughs> um, I, I'm very driven. I, it, you know, as I sort of get into the autumn years of my career, you know, you really want to make a difference. Um, you really want to achieve a result. You really want to inspire the team to stay organized. And I would say, you know, when you look back through the pandemic, we've been, you know, front and center with this in terms of the border. And I firmly believe that the investments that we started to make 
before the pandemic really gave us some resilience in terms of how we've managed through all of the ambiguity um, and attention, sometimes negative on us in terms of how we were managing things. <clears throat> um, you know, there's a lot of armchair quarterbacks out there about how we should have done things differently. And, and that, and that's fine. There was no roadmap for doing anything like this. It truly was a black swan event, but I, but I really like in terms of the team and the strength of the team and the commitment of the team, I think some of the investments that we started to make and continue to make on choosing the right people, choosing the right leaders, supporting these people, um, including myself. I mean, I've gotten a lot of strength from the team that we've created here. I think I've got the best team in government, quite frankly. Um, and it served us well, but I think it's only because we've had the courage to sort of go through a bit of a self-examination process, sometimes together and sometimes individually, that that's put us in in that spot. And, we, and we've done other things too. There's there's other tools out there, but I mean, you know, fundamentally, trust is really important, and knowing that everybody's all in on these things and that we've got that capability and trust um, is is super important. And it all comes back to knowing who you are, as far as I'm concerned. And I, you know, I often joke this, you know, this won't just help you with, you know, what's going at work, but it might help your marriage too, right? Um, in terms of <laughs> understanding and applying judgment in terms of how you play yourself out in, in all of your relationships, not just the ones where you're the leader. I like that, John, you focus on the, the team, even in individual development, because one of the things we know about character development, there's certainly the individual effort and insight that has to go into it, but very few of us, because of the challenges around self-awareness, have that you know, capacity to truly kind of diagnose and move things forward. And one thing I've certainly heard from everybody on your team is your receptivity, uh, which is not an easy thing, right? Is that a lot of times, uh, at the top of the organization, that's where somebody feels like they're not showing vulnerability or they're not showing that kind of accessibility. And then they don't have anybody telling them that uh, you know, they're not perhaps being, bringing their best self to the organization. And I, and I like this notion of, of understanding the, the team itself in the development process to keep everybody. It's, 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 it's almost like an honoring of the other person to say, how do I help them bring their best self? And, you know, maybe, maybe uh, you know, more temperance is required here. So let's, let's remind ourselves about that. I, I, I really like that collective focus on this. Yeah, it's, it's a big team, right? And everyone's got a lot of other stuff going on in their lives as well and sort of understanding that um, and just sort of the extra effort that you need to because of doing everything in this structured work whether it's zoom calls or teams calls or google meets um, it takes that extra bit of effort now that it didn't used to because you don't have those casual interactions everything's structured right um, and i think uh, I'll be honest with you, I, I am a little bit fearful for the hybrid workforce of the future uh, in terms of uh, how leaders will lead as effectively in that space. Um, Cause I think it's really hard. <laughs> like it's really hard. I'm, I'm, you know, as big and scary as I might be, you know, look to be, uh, I really enjoy being with people. I, I solve problems through conversation with others. Right. And um, I am decisive. I don't lack in courage. Um, maybe as I sort of get older, I'm getting a little bit more focused, as I say, to really sort of leave something that, that that's made a difference. But, um, you know, uh, I, I am fearful for this, this workforce that wants to just sort of stay at home locked in their bedroom in front of a screen all the time, because I, I think that's really going to impact a lot of things that we're talking around here in terms of their character and how they're going to progress their leadership journey. I think that's true. I mean, we're going to go through a process, I think, of almost experimenting and trying different models and, and frameworks. And I think it's going to take an enormous amount of character on behalf of leaders and the culture inside of organizations to actually see us through that journey. Um, we're going to, I think there's going to be lots of learning. We need to be open to all of those avenues. Uh, John, your organization has really embraced leadership character. Uh, and it really, it's, you know, it started when you arrived at CBSA almost five years ago. Um, from your perspective, what have been sort of the biggest hurdles you think you know, the organization, you and the organization have, organization have faced 
in terms of bringing leadership character uh, into all parts of the organization? I would say, you know, I. It, it's complicated, right? Because there was no um, well-trodden path for us to follow here. It was, uh, we're kind of making it up as we go along. <laughs> but there's a foundation there, right? But, um, you know, I think it's a bit of a paradigm shift for the public service. I mean, I'm not sure, you know, from public safety to CRA to here, I'm not sure who else you might be working with in the federal government sphere, but it's still, I think, a pretty new idea. Um, and, you know, the, the, even the way we're forced to almost by the rules of the staffing system around key leadership competencies as we're assessing people, it's not the right language for assessing who someone is as a leader. Um, it's more action oriented as opposed to attribution, uh, you know, their attributes that they, that they bring to the table. Um, and so that's been a challenge in terms of, you know, um, who these people really are as opposed to how they get things done. We focus too much on the how they got things done. And, and, and that's important, like how, but like, you know, they weren't a, you know, um, a complete tyrant uh, in terms of how they got the result and the, and the team was decimated at the end, but really understanding who these people are and how they're going to, and for me, really importantly is how they're going to fit into my team. Um, I've got lots of people that want to come and work with me uh, and my organization. And I think that I can afford to be fussy. <laughs> and so, and I'm, and I, and then, you know, using a tool like this to decide, you know, is this someone going to fit in with the team? Is this someone that, yes, they've got a track record. Yes, they've done some things, but do they really know who they are and they, they know how they're going to play with others and what they can bring to the table to the team? is the most important aspect of me for me so i think you know the challenge as i say is the system is still kind of stuck in this key leadership competency kind of place which is you know results orientation vision and strategy um, stakeholder relations but it doesn't talk about the individual and the attributes that they bring to the table to actually get things done um, and so you know i, I think I think we're past this is the flavor of the month thing. I think this is something that people, because it's so accessible and easily understood, people don't doubt it, but you know, we're pushing it into all these different areas beyond just straight recruitment. Um, and you know, having giving people the time and space to go through this process and to understand who they are, um, you know, that takes a, you know, that takes a commitment and I, and I do worry that we've lost a little bit of that time and space throughout the pandemic, but um, you know, it's, there's lots of things that have made it hard. We're a, we're a traditional, I'm the second biggest law enforcement agency in the country, right? Like this isn't something that um, comes easily to a, a, an organization that I would say is maybe a little bit rigid to these types of ideas. I mean, people think we're in a command and control environment and that's not true at all. Um, and uh, it, it, regional differences, uh, what happens at the local level is really important and the responsibility that those frontline supervisors and leaders have on the ground all around the world. Um, you want to empower them, you want to give them the right tools, but it takes time, right? So all of these things, I mean, it's the language that we've used in the past and translating it to the CBL language to the time to actually think it through. Um, just to sort of embed it as a real foundational part of the organization and, and who we want to be and how we want to lead our, our folks. It just takes time, right? I mean, this is a, and this is an important part of the cultural shift that we want to do in the organization. Maybe a follow-up with that, John, is that, you know, a lot of the work that you had to do was, was pioneering work, right? You were, you were doing things differently. Um, and so my, the question, one of the questions that, that I had that I thought about was, well, why didn't you wait for someone else to do that pioneering work? And what would you say to other presidents and CEOs maybe that are sitting there waiting for someone else to do it first before they take it on? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think it's partly about how we've been incentivized to lead, right? Um, 
like I, I won't get any extra promotion performance pay for doing CBL and the CBS. <laughs> right? It's more about, you know, did I keep my minister in a good spot and did I deliver on government priorities? That's the bottom line. Right. And so I think um, people need to unpack that and sort of say, okay, well, how do I actually achieve that result? Right. And taking the time to think that through. So um, for me, it's like, it's kind of like that Apollo 13 scene. It's like, okay, well, here's another, thing that I have that I can bring to the table to achieve the result. Um, and, you know, I've gone through a bunch of other sort of, you know, I don't even know what to call them tools, I guess, you know, whether it's Myers-Briggs or Lumina or <clears throat> other things, and you come out of it with a color or a few scrambled letters, but that's it. Um, and it, there's no conversation really to be had except, well, I'm this and you're that. Right. And maybe there's a bit deeper unpacking about how you relate to each other. And so I think it's around language, like words matter. Right. And behaviors matter. And people are paying attention to who their leaders are and people deserve good leaders. And so you have to give people the space to develop and understand the responsibility that they have and the impact that they have every single day. Um, like I'm always amazed when, you know, people talk to me and then they'll, they'll notice little things about my subtle behaviors, like whether I start moving in the chair a bit or whatever that they, they're, they're, they're hyper aware of everything that I do and say, right. And, and I think that really just emphasizes the responsibility you have to, um, you know, really understand and choose carefully how you lead. I find it uh, interesting, John, that it goes back to the beginning of this conversation where there was such a resonance for you in your own personal experience around something. And, and as you picked up the, uh, even the Olympic experience, you know, the drive, the temperance that's required, the collaboration, that there, there's, there's something in the life experience that says this matters. And, in, in, and importantly, you can develop it. Uh, that I, I think then that quality of saying, even though I don't know what the next step is, uh, I love in this story that is, you know that there's a collaboration piece where others are going to help out. It isn't you have to have it all figured out. Uh, your, your team, your organization, I've witnessed uh, them incredibly, you know, stepping up to uh, embrace and enact on their own character themselves against competence. So I find that that idea of, I guess I come back to this point of an accountability we have as leaders. When we know there's something here that will deliver both sustained excellence and well being, there is an accountability, uh, you know, not to turn the other way and say, oh, that's tough. Uh, it's not an area I know well, but just to say, let somebody else, you know, take it on. And, and I think CBSA has really stepped up to the plate on this and has been a real inspiration to other organizations. So really want to thank you for that. Well, it's a, it's a long journey, but I want to thank you for thinking about this. I know, you know, from the beginnings of how you started down this road with understanding the, the crash and, and sort of the lack of judgment that was brought to bear, but unpacking it and then broadening it out. Like I say, it, I think there's a real universal language here. And, you know, at the end of the day on this thing around the team, I keep coming back to it because it is the most important thing to me is the, um, the resilience that you build, right? And you know, that famous line that resilience is futile, you will be assimilated. Like we're, we're building up that, that resilience and that um, this is who we are. And this is, um, and you know, there's an accountability for you as a leader and you will be expected to sort of um, develop that awareness if you don't already have it, or we're gonna give you the tools to continue to develop and support that because it's just so important to, have that awareness of the leaders and for them to sort of portray that down, right. Um, to those that think they want to, to lead next, right. Cause it's a constant churn, right. Like it's, it's, it's a continuous kind of process. And I just think the, the, the strength of the tool, the accessibility of the language, the practicality of it, um, 
as I say, this the idea of balance in terms of the excess efficiency or vice virtue um, is uh, it's so easily understood, but you just still need to take the time on it, right? And and the team is better off for it, and you professionally and personally, I believe, are better off for it as well. John, um, this has been a great conversation. Uh, the way you've explained how leadership character has affected you and your team and your organization, how you've dealt with the obstacles, I think has been very enlightening and provides, I think, a ton of guidance and inspiration for, for others to follow. Um, any last thoughts or comments that you might have for our audience? Um, you know, other, other leaders that, are, that hear about this concept and hear about leadership character and are kind of wondering what to do next, or what advice might you give them? Well, I would say, first of all, dive into it. <laughs> like if you, I'm not, I'm not sure if you've got one of your sessions uh, just on YouTube, Mary, maybe not the full two hour, but a small session just to sort of understand um, the choices that you can make. And as I say, I think once that little voice gets planted on your shoulder and you move more to responding as opposed to reacting uh, in a situation based on how you understand yourself and how you want to choose to exercise judgment in that situation, um, is really important. And I think that of all the things that I've done, this is the tool that puts it right there, right away. So I think for the public service, but I think all leaders, um, you know, I think we've got to move away from some of these other things that, um, uh, as I say, are a little bit more action oriented, um, as opposed to what we're talking about here, which is more about the attributes and the awareness that you're bringing to the situation and how you're going to choose to lead. Um, I think it's a, a huge opportunity. So, you know, I'm, I'm all in on this, the organization's all in on this. And I really just thank Mary and all the work that she's done to sort of um, bring it to us and to continue to help us develop it on our on our team throughout the entire organization. So Mary and John, anything left to add? The thing that I, I keep focusing on for me is like the culture and the impact that leadership has on the culture of the organization. Um, and there's an intentionality here um, that I just think is so important um, around the language and the understanding of yourself as a leader that um, that's the real secret sauce, I think. Uh, it's about intentionality. There's, I'm, so I'm from the West Coast, right? So another West Coast term, energy follows intention, right? And it's like the, the what you bring as a leader um, is that energy, but you know, what are your intentions? Where do they come from? What's the awareness of, of the situation and who you are and what's going on at that point in time? I, I don't know. I, I just think this really hits the mark. I'm glad that you um, picked up again, John, on the culture side, because I think for anybody listening to this, there are two hot buttons, culture and coupled with equity, diversity, inclusion issues, right? And they, and they get coupled together. And to me, what pulls it all together is unlocking human potential and enabling that human potential in organizations that has been severely limited for all sorts of reasons. I think the, the work around character really levels the playing field because who we are uh, doesn't matter as we know this is a universal approach uh, across cultures, across time, across religions. Uh, working with Indigenous groups around the seven grandfather teachings, for example, and its alignment to character leadership, that people see it is about who they are and an honoring of the tradition from where they came that cultivated that who they are. That it's not about subjugating all of that to an organization that says you have to look like this or sound like this in order to be a leader in the organization. And I think aspects of the culture and the EDI really work together because when you have the full potential of individuals in an organization uh, and, they're all, and they're working in concert, it's like your experience rowing, you know, that you get that kind of high, you know, drive, collaboration, integrity, humility, humanity, it's all working together 
of course, with the competence piece, it's not neglecting that, but it's bringing now into the foreground with intentionality that, you know, I, I would call almost like the superpower of who we are if we only allow it to emerge in organizations. So I'm super excited by uh, what you, you guys are doing. And when I get to watch the workshops that are run within CBSA, even with understanding during the pandemic, I sat in on one two hour workshop where what people were bringing in the foreground, who were we when we did the things we did, right? It was putting the character piece in the foreground to understand that the what you do and how you do it is going to be a function of who you are when you do it. And uh, it was really inspiring. So once again, super thankful for all the work you guys are doing. Well, look, yeah, actually, I just want to riff off what you just said, because actually, I think I'm going to poke at that a little bit in terms of my own team here from the diversity and inclusion perspective, because again, the language transcends the different cultural backgrounds you might have, right? These are sort of universal attributes that it doesn't matter what your heritage is or, you know, um, uh, what culture you might have come from. These are these are universal attributes. And I think that again speaks to the accessibility and the, and the neutrality of the language that everyone can buy into. And I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and unpack that a little bit with my team now because we're really focusing on, you know, bringing that out. I've got a, I'm very lucky to have a very diverse workforce, but um, not everybody wants to lead, but I don't know that we've been supported, supporting them to, unpack their leadership potential necessarily, right? And that's another piece here with the language that I think really is cross-cultural that I'd like to I'd like to sort of explore a little bit with my team. This has been a great discussion, uh, John. Uh, again, I think it's been very illuminating, really very helpful for, for people who are both familiar and not familiar with leadership character and the potential that I think it brings to an organization and to people. And I, th I think your story is just beginning. And I think the the effects of what you're going to be doing and, and the, uh, it's we've, you've just really started here in terms of changing organizations and people's lives and, and how teams work. So you know, thank you again for for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. And Mary as well, uh, thank you so much too. If you like what you've uh, heard today, then please share it with your friends and your colleagues. If you really like what you've heard today, then please feel free to subscribe to our podcast, Question of Character. We also have a website, questionofcharacter.com, where we'll be posting resources and articles uh, and any links that are associated with today's discussion. Um, we also post links to the Ian O. Inatowitz Institute for Leadership at the Ivy Business School, where there are even more resources and articles and information about the Ivy Leader Character Framework. So thank you again to John and to Mary, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again next time. Mm -hmm.